good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Great Hearts Annual Bard Competition for this year. This year we have 12 contestants, one from each school, one from each archway here in the valley, and we're very excited. Uh, the quality of poetry you'll see tonight, I think you'll be very um, impressed with. I certainly am. Uh, I want to thank uh, Veritas for letting us uh, have our competition here. And I want to recognize our judges here that we have sitting in front of us. I'm going to introduce each of them. Uh, we have Lisa Armstrong. She's a curriculum development coordinator here at Great Hearts Academy. <laughs> um, we have Brandon Crow, our superintendent for Great Hearts Arizona. Leanne Fawcett, executive director of Lower Schools in Arizona. Amy Gautry, regional manager of professional development here for Great Hearts Arizona. And Cami Passy, director of curriculum, Lower Schools for Great Hearts Academies. My name is Joy Hanks. I am the accuracy judge, and I'm the dean of students at Archway Glendale. Uh, we just want to welcome you. Thank you for being here to support your bards. And I want to turn the floor over to uh, Miss Bryant, who has overseen the uh, whole process of getting your bards here and uh, going through it. So let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, Miss Hanks. Wow, I'm so excited to be here. This is by far my favorite event of the year, and I truly mean that when I say it. It's not just something that I'm saying to make you all feel warm fuzzies inside. I've been in this network for 10 years, and I've gone to almost every bard competition for the last decade. Coming from a background in competitive poetry myself, on a collegiate and a high school level, I want to just express how special this event is because of who we are as a Great Hearts Network. Our values have really brought us together from the beginning. That's why you're all here. That's what drew, drew your families to us in the first place. And what makes this event special is we get the opportunity to really show off what we mean when we say beauty. Beauty, as we know, is an essential part of the human experience. The sound of a violin, can soothe our souls in great times of sorrow. An epic painting can inspire us in moments of downtrodden monotony. And poetry can remind us of things that we once knew, but have forgotten. Without the symbols and the imagery of Frost's house among the purple-stemmed raspberries or Dickinson's bird of hope perched in the soul, the most tender and hidden emotions could never rise to the surface of our hearts and remind us what's truly precious in life. Poetry is uniquely special because it is spoken word. And it's different from other forms of spoken art. The job of a bard is to be a vessel for a poem. To let the poem and the words and the author speak through them rather than on behalf of them or for them. The poems you are about to hear all have a unique message. No matter the age of the bard, the listener, or the era, please listen to what each of these bards have to tell you tonight and use the words of these young bards to unlock perhaps a hidden truth that has been hiding and nestling within yourselves a long time. I also invite you to really truly take a moment of real deep gratitude for what they have done. They've spent hours upon hours of their time, their energy, they've spent a lot of time memorizing, they've put so much work into what they've done. It's a very unique expression of themselves as well as it is the actual poet themselves. So without further ado, um, I truly invite you to be present as much as you can with every single word that each of these bards come up and speak with you tonight. And without further ado, our 2023-2024 Great Hearts Bard competitors, please give a round of applause.
Hello, my name is Riel Ames, and I will be performing Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare, Act 2, Scene 2. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or, if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is no hand, no foot, no arm, no face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name that which we call a rose, but any other name would smell as sweet? So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that due perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo, doff thy name. And for that name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. Hi, my name is Lincoln Carpenter, and I will be performing The Trees Are Down by Charlotte Mew. And he cried with a loud voice, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees. They are cutting down the great plane trees at the end of the gardens. For days there has been the great of the saw, the swish of the branches as they fall, the crash of the trunks, the rustle of trodden leaves. With the whoops and the woes, the loud common talk, the loud common laughs of the men above it all. I remember one evening of a long past spring, turning in at a gate, getting out of a cart, and finding a large dead rat in the mud of the drive. I remember thinking, alive or dead, a rat was a godforsaken thing. But at least, in May, that even a rat should be alive. The week's work here is as good as done. There's just one bow on the roped bowl in the fine gray rain. Green and high and lonely against the sky. Down now, 
And but for that, if an old dead rat did once for a moment unmake the spring, I might never have thought of him again. It is not for a moment the spring is unmade today. These were great trees. It was in them from root to stem. When the men with the whoops and the woes have parted the whole of the whispering loveliness away, half the spring for me will have gone with them. It is going now, and my heart has been struck with the hearts of the plains. Half my life has beat with these. In the sun, in the rains, in the March wind, the May breeze, in the great gales that came over to them, across the roofs, from the great seas, there was only a quiet rain when they were dying. They must have heard the sparrows fly. In the small creeping creatures in the earth where they were lying. But I, all day, I heard an angel crying, hurt not the trees. My name is Chloe Cruz, and I will be reciting Human Family by Maya Angelou. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious, some thrive on comedy. Some declare their lives are lived as true profundity. Others claim they really live the real reality. The variety of our skin tones can confuse me, muse the light. Brown and pink and beige and purple, tan and blue and white. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane, but I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mere twins are different, although their features jive, and lovers think quite different thoughts while lying side by side. We love and lose in China. We weep on England moors. We laugh and moan in Guinea and thrive on Spanish shores. We seek success in Finland, are born and die in Maine. In minor ways we differ, in major we're the same. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, and we are unlike. 
We are more alike, my friends, than we are alike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. Hi, my name is Caitlin Gumrock and I will be reciting Love, number three, by George Herbert. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful? Ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, Who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them, but my shame Gort doth deserve. And know you not, says Love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says Love and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Deborah, and I will be reciting the poem Solitude by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and you weep alone. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth, but has trouble enough of its own. Sing, and the hills will answer. Sigh, it is lost on the air. The echoes bound to a joyful sound, but shrink from voicing care. Rejoice, and men will seek you. Grief, and they turn and go. They want full measure of all your pleasure, but they do not need your woe. Be glad, and your friends are many. Be sad, and you lose them all. There are none to decline your nectared wine, but alone you must drink life's gull. Feast, and your halls are crowded. Fast, and the world goes by. Succeed and give, and it helps you live, but no man can help you die. There is room in the halls of pleasure for a large and lordly train, but one by one, we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. My name is Lisa Kucherkarova, and I'm going to be reciting The Psalm of Life by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, What the Heart of the Young Man Said to the Psalmist. Tell me not, in more than numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art. To dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow find us farther than today. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still, like muffled drums, are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God overhead. 
Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime. And, departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing over life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for anything, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. Hello, my name is Vidyut Nandish, and today I will be reciting If by Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing dares, it's blaming on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, tough deal and lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet, don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream, and not make dreams your master, if you can think, and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to, broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose your common touch, if neither foes 
nor loving friends can hurt you. If all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that is in it. And which is more? You'll be a man, my son! Hi, my name is Eleanor Patient, and I will be presenting A Dialogue Between the Soul and the Body by Andrew Marval. Soul. Oh, who shall from this dungeon raise a soul enslaved so many ways with bolts of bones that fettered stands and feet in manacled in hands, here blinded with an eye, and there deaf with the drumming of an ear. A soul hung up, as twere, in chains of nerves, in arteries, in veins, tortured besides each other part, in a vain head, in double heart. Body. Oh, who shall me deliver whole from bonds of this tyrannic soul, which stretched upright impales me so that mine own precipice I go, and warms and moves this needless frame? A fever could but do the same, and wanting where its spite to try has made me live. To let me die, a body that could never rest since this ill spirit it possessed. Soul, what magic could me thus confine within another's grief to, to pine? Where whatsoever it complain, I feel that cannot feel the pain. And all my care itself employs that to preserve which me destroys. Constrained not only to endure diseases, but what's worse, the cure. And ready off the port to gain, am shipwrecked into health again.
body. But physic yet can never reach the maladies thou me dost teach. Whom first the cramp of hope does tear, and then the palsy shakes a fear. The pestilence of love does heat, or hatred's hidden ulcer eat. Joy's tearful madness does perplex, or sorrow's other madness vex, which knowledge forces me to know, and memory will not forgo. What but a soul could have the wit to build me up for sin so fit? So architects do square and hue. Green trees that in the forest grew. Hi, my name is Ryan e. Salmon, and today I will be reciting Casey at the Bell. And when we respond, 
morning, two chairs he laid in the doctor's hat. No stranger in the crowd the doubt was Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes upon him as he rode his hand at first. Five thousand tons of plotting as he rode them on his shirt. In marble and in picture, from the wall to his hip, to find his gleam from Casey's eye, a sneer from Casey's lip. And now the leather covered spear came hurling through the air. And Casey stood watching in a haughty venture there. Close by the student batsman, the ball continued to sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the bleachers, black people went up and off in the war. Let the beating of the storm wind on the stern and the shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire! shouted someone from the stand. And it's likely they had done it, and not Casey with his hand. With a smile of red and cherry, red Casey's within the shown. He stilled the rising tumult, and he bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more his fury flew. But Casey stood a moment, and the umpire said, Strike two! Frog! cried the mad thousands, and the echo answered, Frog! But one storm from the from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face was turned cold, they saw his mental strength, and they knew that Casey would not let that fall without a game. The was gone, and he said, his teeth are clenched with hate. He pounded with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher pulls the ball, and now he to go. And now they are shattered by the force of his flow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere in hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in love. Hi, my name is Samuel Scheidelman, and I'll be reciting first in Augur Address by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a day of national consecration, and I am certain that on this day, my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision, which the present situation of our people impels. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly, 
nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, it will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and of vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. And I am convinced that you will again give that support to leadership in these critical days. In such a spirit on my part and on yours, we face our common difficulties. They concern, thank God, only material things. Values have shrunk to fantastic levels. Taxes have risen. Our ability to pay has fallen. Government of all kinds is faced by serious curtailment of income. The means of exchange are frozen in the currents of trade. The withered leaves of industrial enterprise lie on every side. Farmers find no market for their produce, and the savings of many years and thousands of families are gone. More important, a host of unemployed citizens face the grim problem of existence and an equally great number of toil with little return. Only a foolish optimist can deny the dark realities of the moment. And yet, our distress comes from no failure of substance. We are stricken by no plague of locusts, compared with the perils which our forefathers conquered because they believed and were not afraid. We have so much to be thankful for. I'm Maya Tokoff, and I'm reciting The Owl Critic by James Thomas Coates. Who stuffed that white owl? No one spoke in the shop. The barber was busy, and he couldn't stop. The customers waiting their turns were all reading. The Daily, the Herald, the Post, little pleading. The young man who blurted out such a blunt question, not one raised a head, or even made a suggestion. And the barber? kept on shaving. Don't you see, Mr. Brown? cried the youth with a frown. How wrong the whole thing is. How preposterous each wing is. 
how flat in the head is, how jammed down the neck is. In short, the whole owl, what an ignorant wreck it is. I make no apology. I've learned owlology. I pass days and nights in a hundred collections and cannot be blinded to any deflections arising from unskillful fingers that fail to step a bird right from his beak to his tail. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, do take that bird down or you'll see him be the laughing stock all over town. And the barber kept on shaving. I've studied owls and other night fowls, and I tell you what I know to be true. An owl cannot roost with its limbs so unloose. No owl in this world ever had his claws curled, ever had his legs slanted, ever had his bill canted, ever had his neck screwed into that attitude. He can't do it because he's against all bird laws. Anatomy teaches, ornithology preaches that an owl has a toe. That can't turn out so. I've made the white owl my study for years, and to see such a job must move me to tears. Mr. Brown, I'm amazed. You should be so gone crazed as to put up a bird in that posture absurd. To look at that owl really brings on a dizziness. The man who stuffed him don't know half his business. And the barber? kept shaving. Just then, with a wink and a sly normal lurch, the owl, very gravely, got down from his perch, walked around and regarded his fault-finding critic, who thought he was stuffed with a glance analytic, and then fairly hooted as if he should say, your learning's at fault this time anyway. Don't waste it again on a live bird, I pray. I'm an owl. You're another. Sir Critic, good day. And the barber kept on shaving. Hello, my name is Ava Wilcox, and I'll be reciting Hamlet, Act 4, Scene 4 by William Shakespeare. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. 
What is a man if his chief good and much of his time be but to sleep and feed? A beast no more. Sure he that made us with such a large discourse, looking before and after, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fust in us unused. Now, whether it be bestial oblivion or some craven scruple of thinking too precisely on the event, a thought which squirted half the one part wisdom and never three parts coward. I do not know why yet I have to say these things to do. Sith I have cause and will and strength and means to do it. Examples, gross as earth, exhort me. Witness this army of such mass and charge led by a delicate and tender prince, whose spirit with divine ambition pot makes mouths of the invisible event, exposing was mortal and unsure to all that fortune, death, and danger dare, even for an eggshell. Rightly to be great is not to stir with thy great argument, but greatly to find coil in the straw when honor's at the stake. How stand I then to have a father killed, a mother stained, excitement to my reason, my blood, and the all sleep? Well, to my shame, I see the imminent death of 20,000 men that for a fantasy and trick of fame with their graves like beds fight for a plot where on the numbers cannot try the cause, which is not tomb enough and continent to hide the slain. Oh, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody, or be nothing worth. Thank you. We are now going to take sort of an intermission, though there isn't going to be more performances afterwards. What we'll do is we'll allow the judges to finish their judging process, and then we will tally all of the scores in here while you guys are out in the cafeteria, which is just going to be outside of the Lund Center, through the glass doors and to your left. There will be light refreshments and water for you to enjoy. And when the judges are finished picking the bard winner and runner-up, we will invite you back inside for our award ceremony. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in about 15 minutes.
Again, thank you so much for being here this evening, and a big, huge special thank you to all 12 bar finalists. You guys have obviously done so much work to be here, and I want you to be really proud of yourselves, obviously, no matter what happens. Yes, it is a competition, but ultimately, at the end of the day, you have given a gift, and that's huge, and we want to thank you for that. So. runner-up and barred winner for the 2022-2023 year, I would like to just sort of tell you about what's going to happen to our barred winner. At the beginning of next year, of the 2023 year in the fall, there is a large event called the Gala, the Great Hearts Gala. It's an event that is a very black tie fancy event where basically a lot of members of the community, including our own, will come together to essentially fundraise uh, for our charter. And so it's kind of a really nice event. We have really lovely things that happen at the event. And one of the things that happens is our previous bard comes to perform for the group. If for whatever reason that bard is not able to attend, then we have a runner up ready to go. So that's kind of something to look forward to. Another thing to look forward to is tomorrow morning, Fox News, our local channel, is going to be inviting our Bard winner for an interview that is surrounded around the idea of local school poetry. So we'll have another opportunity to kind of get involved with the community as well, which is really exciting. This is the first year we've ever been able to do that, which is great. Um, our poetry competition this evening has been live streamed and recorded, and we will send you out information on how to access that video so that you can watch it again and enjoy it uh, with family members and friends that weren't able to see it tonight. So without further ado, our runner up bard winner is Eva Koju Harvola. <laughs> for the Great Hearts Championship of 2022-2023 is Lincoln Carpenter! <laughs> Thank you for supporting the arts. We'll see you next time.